heart heavy in hand, badass music for badass listeners with Pariah Burke. Hey, this is Tracy Guns from LA Guns and Sunbomb, and you're listening to the Hard Heavy and Hair Show with Pariah Burke. Rock and roll. Tracy Guns, who gave his name to the band LA Guns and earlier Guns and Roses before Slash joined as lead guitarist, rose to the top of the Sunset Strip music scene in its early 80s heyday and has never slowed down since. If you've ever seen Tracy play a guitar solo, it's difficult to recognize where the instrument ends and the man begins. The intensity with which Tracy Guns plays guitar, the way he melts out of our dimension and into a world of sound, is awe-inspiring. He writes and records with nearly the same intensity and speed that he plays guitar. After 10 studio albums with L.A. Guns, two with Brides of Destruction, a supergroup he co-founded with Nikki Six, and eight other records with various projects. Tracy is a tireless guitar player and songwriter. And now, he's got a brand new collaboration with Michael Sweet of Striper. A completely new sound in the very heavy metal, doom metal influenced debut record of the project called Sunbomb. I recently spoke with Tracy over video chat about Sunbomb and its departure from his usual punk and hard rock influenced writing. About the lawsuit he filed against former bandmates Steve Riley and Kelly Nichols to get back sole rights to the L.A. Guns name. And whether Tracy is happy with the outcome of that lawsuit announced just the day before our conversation. And among other topics, we talked about the two new L.A. Guns albums he's working on now. Hello. Hi there. How you doing? Good. How are you? I'm hanging in there. Awesome. Uh, Tracy Guns, thank you for joining me on the Hard Heavy and Hair Show today. Good times. I'm glad to be here. There's a lot going on for you right now. You got Sunbomb, the new cocked and loaded live album, and I want to ask you about both of those. But first, okay. congratulations are in order. Your eponymous band, LA Guns, is now the only LA Guns. That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> it only took my whole life to get that straight. <laughs> <laughs> Are you happy with the outcome? Yeah, I mean, I got what I, what I you know, needed. It, it wasn't cheap, you know. Oh, but, sure not. Uh, you know, we live in a, in a weird world. That's all I can say. But, yeah, I, I'm very happy with where we're at now. Good. So uh, you and Phil Lewis were plaintiffs in the suit. Does Correct. that mean you both share ownership of the L.A. Guns name? Um, no, but I have generously offered him 49% of the name as my, my partner in life, creating all this great music over the years. And, um, he truly deserves it. You know, I mean, he's been the voice of the band, whether I'd been there or not at times, you know, so he's the one that's really carried the torch this whole time. And, um, you know, nobody deserves that more. So that means that, you know, when we die, you know, his kids get, you know, 49% of everything. Well, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Carry on the LA guns legacy. That's right. Uh, so lawsuits like that can often take years, but you filed in January, 2020 and right. you settled 15 months later in April, 2021. That's right. Do you think it would have been over sooner if not for COVID? No, um, I had to keep making decisions, you know, every step of the way, because we actually, we were suing like 13 different entities. You know, there oh, were, wow. there were people that were, uh, putting my logo on t-shirts, for example, and selling them that were deals that were made with the other guy, you know, that were all fraudulent, you know, so it was very complicated and um, I could have taken it further because, you know, one of the, another part of the lawsuit was this question of royalties that not, none of the band members had been paid um, for years, starting in like 1994, 95, 
um, including one of the guys that's in that other band. He had never been paid. Um, but the deal is, is it would have cost X amount of dollars to take it that far, do, do the audit, all these things. And then what's the return on that, you know? And that guy's got no money. So it's like, hmm. So I had to like, you know, think long and hard about certain decisions, you know, of like, well, you know, if we spend this kind of money, we're not gonna get any money back. And then, so what's the point of wasting more time? And then that would have taken a lot more time, you know, cause they have this process called the discovery process. And right. that's where lawsuits could definitely take years, you know, um, going through all these, what would they be? They would be accountings that, you know, just don't exist or, you know, people pretending they don't exist or these things and you got to dig deep and, and, and it gets timely and expensive. So ultimately at the end of the day where it ended up and what I settled on makes the most sense, you know, for everybody. And is the, the royalties all worked out now so that going forward, everybody who should get paid is getting paid? Yeah, unfortunately, a lot of that stuff, you know, those royalties were on album and CD sales, you know, and those don't really exist anymore. You know, I mean, it, it, but I mean, yes, things have been redirected to where they're supposed to go. But, you know, that part of the business is kind of gone. So that's life. Yeah, well, that that part's unfortunate, but I do congratulate you on getting this settled and behind you and being able to move forward. Right on. Thank you very much. Do you think there would ever be a chance for reconciliation with those guys in that other band? No, there's not even the slimmest chance. And there's a lot of reasons for it. You know, one, the musician guy is the laziest musician in the world. And then the other guy's too old to play the new stuff. So it, it just couldn't ever happen, you know? Can I ask who's the laziest guy in the world? Kelly Nichols. Okay. I wasn't sure if you meant Steve or Kelly. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not being a dick. It's a fact. You know, after, you know, after those guys, you know, Kelly quit and I started playing with guys like, you know, Rudy Sarzo and Johnny Martin, Nikki Six, you know, these guys that are real bass players. It's just like, it's like, whoa, you know, what was I thinking? You know, but, you know, I got Kelly. I was all about image. You know, I wanted a guy that looked like he was a Motley Crue and he looked like Tommy Lee. So it made the most sense at the time. I see. Yep. Oh, I made a lot of bad decisions. I'm not saying I'm perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Let's turn this down. Brides of Destruction. Were yeah, oh, that, was, okay. that was my band with, with Nikki. And, you know, interesting thing about Nikki, you know, Nikki takes a lot of slack for not being, you know, a talented bass player. But in fact, he has an extraordinary amount of talent as a musician. You know, he, um, I'll never forget this one day, I came into rehearsal and a couple of things really struck me as interesting. This, I'll stick to this story for a second. And he goes, Tracy, write the longest riff you could, you could come up with right now. And the riff was so long that it was in two parts, you know, it was kind of like this black dog kind of thing. And then, you know, into like a La Via Strangiato kind of thing, you know, just like, you know, forever going. Right. Yeah. And I showed it to him in two parts. I go, okay, here's this first part. And he absorbed it instantly. Like I could never play it again. You know what I mean? It was one of those <laughs> things like a total mess of notes. And then I showed him the second part and he fucking played that thing from start to finish, you know, like 128 notes, you know, and I was wow. like, like, wow, man, you know, that was amazing. And he goes, he goes, see, I can play, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> then, but then another thing that was really interesting about him, which was really humble and, and those two words, you know, Nikki Six and humble don't go together very often. But, you know, when we first started playing together, he asked me, he said, what's a really good way to learn more about the bass, you know, and I'm like, I'm like, well, you know, uh, you could get DVDs at Guitar Center and, you know, pick some styles and, and, you know, learn new stuff. And he did, 
you know, he went to Guitar Center and got some DVDs, learned one was blues and one was like, you know, heavy rock or something. And he just did it. You know, he was so interested in in being a great musician, but very shy about it and very like most, you know, students, because um, that's what I do mostly now is I teach. We're all scared of the instrument. You know what I mean? So it's like it's like, ugh. So to have like some kind of security blanket, like a teacher or something like that really helps. But, but Nikki's really talented guy. Yeah, he is. Uh, I know, I know he's been taking, um, bass and guitar lessons during COVID, you know, yeah. and just keeping improving on his musician, on his music. Yeah. Um, well, it tells the world that he loves music, you know, and that's important. Yeah. Yeah. You got to love what you do. Life's too short to it do is. anything else. That's right. Speaking of loving what you do, Sunbomb. Yes. So let's talk about Sunbomb. Sunbomb is the project. Evil and Divine is the album title. And people hearing about it for the first time might expect a particular sound. But this is not the Tracy Guns from L.A. Guns or Contraband or Brides of Destruction, is it? I, um, I think it has elements because, you know, I've been, you know, tried to inject these types of styles in everything I've ever done, but it's in very small doses. So this is really the, I had a band called Killing Machine in like 93, which was like the closest thing to this. But this is really the first focused, I don't give a shit what anybody thinks metal album I've ever done. You know, just like, you know, like the teenager me with the influences I had when I was a teenager, really learning how to play guitar and and become like that shreddy kind of guy. this was the opportunity to do that, you know, um, Frontiers Records came to me and said, hey, you know, we want you to do a solo record. And I'm like, like, Ear! you know, I'm not making an instrumental record, you know, I'm not doing it, you know, kind of a thing. And, and they were like, no, do whatever you want, you know. So, of course, I said yes, because it's more money, you know, I mean, we all need money. We're goddamn musicians. And uh, <laughs> I wrote a few things, you know, and me and my wife had been doing these Sunday drives, um, listening to the most extreme metal we could find on Spotify. You know, we, we were doing this every weekend for like six months. And, you know, there was a lot of stuff, you know, that, you know, I say newer, but stuff that's like 20 years old, 15 years old, that was so um, influenced by things like Randy Rhodes and Black Sabbath and Iron Maiden and you know, scorpions and all these same influences that I had when I was a teenager that it, I just absorbed all that stuff. And I wrote a few songs. I was like, 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 wow, OK, this is what I'm going to do. You know, like, like I'm going to just make a record of my favorite kind of metal. But the problem was, who's going to sing it? You know, because the, the greatest way to destroy great music is, is you know, a vocal. <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> and this great music. Like, who am I going to get to ruin this music? You know? And I had met Michael Sweet about a year earlier, and I really liked him. You know, we we hung out on the L.A. Guns bus in Massachusetts, and you know, really cool guy. You know, has his uh, his shit together. And I just reached out to him. I sent him one song and a text message. I said, Hey, you know, listen. To, what do you think of this? You know. And uh, he wrote me back right away and said, What is this? You know. I go, oh, that's, you know, I just wrote this song and demoed it. And, and uh, he's like, he's like, wow. I go, you want to sing on it? You know, and he's like, yeah, I want to sing on it. I go, well, do you want to sing on 11 of these? <laughs> you know, kind of a thing. <laughs> and uh, he goes, oh, you're making a record. I go, yeah. You know, do you want to do it? And he's like, I'm in. And um, so it took me about another year to finish writing the music, you know, because once I got to like six or seven songs, I was kind of meddled out, you know, I was like, it's like, like, oh shit, I got to finish this. What, you know, you need inspiration or you just need it to come. And eventually it did. And, uh, I sent it to him. I sent him everything recorded, you know, drums, everything's done, you know, no more demoing. Like this was the album now sing on it. So it took about another year for him to complete writing it with our friend Alessandro, who helped him with lyrics and melodies and stuff like that. And then Michael recorded it. And about a year later, I started getting 
one song at a time back. And I was like a kid, you know, hearing this stuff for the first time, just like, yeah, you know, this is it. He nailed it. You know, this, and then every song that came in, I would get more excited. And it's almost like I was self-sabotaging, you know, I was waiting for like a couple of real clunkers, you know, like waiting, you know, to make a bad comment. And I didn't want to make any bad comments. So, you know, it's just like, ah, when's the bad song going to come in? And it didn't, it never, it never came in. And um, so at that point when I had all 11 songs and I listened to it and I was continually listening to this, that, this album over and over again, that was the success of the album already. You know, it was like, it was like, <clears throat> it was like I achieved what I set out to achieve. And then now it's coming out and people actually like it. It's like, oh, okay, that's the bonus, you know, it's nice. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a really good album. I've been listening to it. Thanks. Uh, is, do you have a favorite on the album? Is there any song that really stands out to you? I think the most immediate song for me is that song called Better End. It's the last single we put out. It's just so immediate and the riff is so repetitive and pounds in your skull. Um, and, you know, again, you know, it's like two people's records, you know, it's like, so I love everything Michael did, you know, so like it's hard to pick a favorite because I enjoy listening to his vocal so much that I get excited like when one song's almost over and the next one's coming on. It's like, oh yeah, you know, I'm gonna check this out. And I remember, cause I was in Denmark. I live in Denmark half the time. I was in Denmark when everything was done. And uh, I didn't really start listening to it in, in the car until I got back to the States. And my guitar tech lives at the house while I'm gone. And he picked me up from the airport uh, and I'm like, hey, you got to hear this. You know, we put it in in the car. And he, and he was just like, man, I feel like a teenager. We should smoke a joint. <laughs> you know, kind of thing. <laughs> and I'm like, like, in theory, yeah, we should. <laughs> you know, so it's got a really good, you know, positive vibe around it, I think. You know, and that, and that always makes something great, you know, when, when there's good energy. I mean, and it's a dark record, but you know, it, it's definitely good energy. Yeah, it is. So, were you uh, driving around banging your head or playing your air guitar? Oh yeah, to your own music. Nice. Yeah, like who's that guitarist, man? Listen to that shit. <laughs> that's, that's dope. You know, like, and that's a good. You know, I really try to do that when records are done. You know, I try to listen to it as a fan of the music, and I should be a fan of the music because I wrote all that stuff, and it should be exactly what I wanted to do. All the time it's not, most of the time it is. But in this case, it really was. And I'm really able to stand back from it because it's not what I typically record, you know? So it's a little bit extra exciting for me. And it's the right. first time I ever did an album with one guitar sound. You know, I was like, yeah, man, you know, tweaking. I use this thing called the head rush. Got that sound just how I wanted it. And I used it on the entire record. And normally like, then the other project, you know, I have a, you know, small truck full of amplifiers and guitars and I try to be an artist as they say but with this one there's no artistry it's just straight out you know bam stoked yeah it, it's it's a really good sound I'm, I'm really enjoying listening to the record and it sounds like you really had a good time making it big time big time and I'm glad that translates to your ears because you know it's, it's funny um, when I don't think we were married yet when I started recording and we had this apartment. It was sizable, but we were always in the living room. So I'm writing and recording this shit on the floor on my laptop. <laughs> you know, she's reading books and, you know, and, and I'm recording no headphones, you know, I mean, full on speakers and everything. And she's just like, that's really good. You know, like every couple hours, you know, like, oh, right on, you know, cool. She was sitting on this couch. <laughs> Right on. Is that your Denmark place or? States? No, this this is the L.A. house. I'm in L.A. right now. Ah. Any trouble traveling back and forth this past year? No, I mean, for me, because, you know, I'm married to a Dane and we have a kid and those things, it makes it really, really easy, actually. Um, it's never, I can't imagine this a more simple time for someone in my position to travel because I'm on these huge Dreamliner airplanes flying across the ocean with like 20 other people. 
you know, oh, wow. it's like, it's like nobody on the flights. Um, but you know, you got to get, now I have to get two COVID tests every time I leave or, or, you know, one way or the other. And one of those tests has to be within four hours of boarding the plane. Oh, so it's a little hectic, you know, like getting that, those tests together and making sure I have enough masks and all my paperwork and all this stuff. But other than that, um, it's pretty smooth. It's, it's pretty smooth. You know, I'm going to be bummed when, when the airports are full and the planes are full again, I'm going to be like, damn it. You know, I don't have a whole <laughs> airplane to myself anymore. <laughs> yeah. I haven't flown this past year, but you know, when the, when everything was shut down, it was nice to drive around on empty roads. Yeah, it was, especially here in LA because it's, it's a nightmare here. I mean, I don't want to put down the city I grew up in, but it's a fucking hellhole right now. It's in such bad shape and nobody's taking care of anything. It's just all talk. You know, I mean, it, it's, it's scary right now. It's weird. That's why my family's in Denmark and not here. There's no reason for them to be here. That's gotta be tough though. It is tough. It is tough, but you know, uh, just try to be patient. You know, and, and so far, so good. So let's talk about the live album. Okay. So you also just announced, I mean, today. Today, yeah. The the release of the upcoming live Cocked and Loaded on July 9th. Is that the complete live playthrough of the whole album? It is. And we added the one of the new songs called Speed from the Missing Peace album um, just to fill out time because I think Cocked and Loaded was like coming in at 34 minutes or something. It's a pretty short album. Uh, maybe it's longer than that. I think the first album's 34 minutes. But anyways, I wanted to make sure it was at least almost an hour. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and it was kind of a, a kind of a last minute idea because we had done a live stream and that's where the recording is from. Is from We did a multi-track recording of this live stream we did and we were way behind on our deadline for the new LA Gun Studio album. So the label suggested, hey, do you have a live show that we could use as a live, to put out as a live record while we're waiting for the studio record? And I'm like, like I think we do, you know, but I, I, I had to like go through it, I had to go listen. I said, well, we, have, we just performed Cocked and Loaded, we have multi-track and it sounds great. And so we decided to do that and um, Adam Hamilton, who's kind of like the sixth member of LA Guns, you know, he's done everything in this band from, you know, play bass to play guitar to, you know, engineer, record, mix. He plays drums on the new LA Gun studio record. He, he got a hold of the recording and he's the one that really had to put it together because there was some, some issues with the bass drum mic not recording well and things like that so it he did put a lot of work into this live record and um it turned out good you know uh my belief with live records is you don't do overdubs you know what i mean it's like it's supposed to be live so uh there's warts you know what i mean there's definitely you know things that are live you know you yeah. can you can definitely tell it's a live album you know there's nothing none of the music has been repaired so to speak or the vocals so it is what it is and it's the one playthrough a lot of a lot of times with live albums you'll record multiple shows pick the best pieces but this is one this straight is set this is it and we didn't know we were recording which might have benefited us you know um because everybody pretty much nailed what they're supposed to do um the only issues that i have with it is like you know, some of the vocal mics were off. My theremin mic wasn't on, you know, for malaria. I played theremin. You can hear it because it's bleeding through the other microphones. But, it, you know, I didn't, we didn't have control of certain things in the mix. But, you know, it's still better than, a, you know, a tape recorder bootleg, <laughs> for yeah. sure. I'm actually looking forward to that album. Um, I was at the concert. I was one of the online viewers. Nice. Um, and it looked like you guys were playing well, but Veep did a really bad mix yeah. on the online. They did. Um, so I'm really looking forward to hearing what it what it sounded like in the room. Exactly. You know, that was uh, 
the complaint from almost everybody, especially for like the first three or four songs, uh, it was really bad. So there was an idea to um, put it out as kind of like a DVD thing too. But now the way it's mixed, the, it, the sync wouldn't really line up properly and the original audio mix is terrible. <laughs> you know, so, but you know, the performance was good, and a friend of mine, John Bird, always tells me when I started engineering, you know, and I was obsessed with like, hey, you know, what kind of compression do I use? What kind of microphone do I use? Blah blah blah. And his thing was like, you know, if a good song's a good song, it doesn't matter how you record it because it's still a good song, you know. And if it's a bad song, all the great equipment and you know, ingenuity and smarts in the studio is not going to make it a good song, you know, which. So that was kind of an awakening for me as far as recordings go and how you present your music. And sometimes you just got to go, that's what we got. You know, is yeah. it great? Yeah, it's great. Could it be better? Yeah, it could be better, but it's still great. You know, so had we gone in with the intention of recording a live album, I obviously would have been involved in the recording process. And I probably would have paid more attention to, to detail and things as far as how we recorded it. But it sounds great. And the songs are there. And we're mostly in tune, you know. So that's a good place to start. Mostly, yeah. Mostly. So it's it's great that you're... A lot of artists go back and, and they second-guess themselves and they just nitpick, you know. So it's it's great that you have this ability to say well could it be better sure but is it good is it great yes and then right leave it yeah and, and not I, tinker forever yeah I, I mean i really you know in the last five years because i've recorded all the la guns records the sun bomb record stuff done a lot of sessions for people and <clears throat> when something feels good you know when something's coming back through the speakers and it feels good, that's it. You know what I mean? I'm like, because of course I could overdo it, overdo it, overdo it, and do it over, do it over, do it over. But once it feels right, that's it. You know, that's 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 the threshold, you know? Um, yeah. Because at that point, once I go past that point, then it becomes a little slick. You know, it becomes a little bit, uh, you know, too perfect which is not my style, you know, it's not my style to be, you know, super glossy, super, you know, just clean, you know, I mean, my, that's kind of the signature of LA Guns is that we're a dirty sounding band, you know, so um, once something feels right and it has that, that, that feeling, that's when I stop and move on to whatever the next thing is, you know, in the project. Um, so certainly with a, with a live record, with LA Guns, and we've done a few. I think this is probably the third real live record we've done. And they've all been approached like that. You know, it's kind of like, hey, let's throw some mic up, mics up, and let's hope everybody does a good job, you know? And um, it, it seems to work out, and people enjoy the LA Guns live records from the past. So I think for LA Guns fans, this is a treat because it's LA Guns, it's cocked and loaded, it's our biggest record, our most popular songs are on there so um there can't really be anything bad about the project no and, and some of these songs you've never done live before pretty much um i'm trying to think because you know cocked and loaded was such a a thing when it came out that i know for sure for sure like the first three shows of that tour we played the whole record, like, cause we, oh, okay. cause we also played the whole first record in those concerts. So it was like the whole first record, then cocked and loaded, and then plus cover tunes and guitar solos and drum solos. So those first shows on the cocked and loaded tour were like, you know, two and a half hours long and we got bored. So we started hacking songs out of the set. So, but I'm sure like Magdalene or something, I probably haven't played since then you know, since like 1989 or 90, whenever it was, you know, and that was a, that was a ball breaker relearning that song because 
I can play all the parts. Um, but then when I play to the original recording, it's like twice as fast as I play it. <laughs> you know, so when it comes to the solo, it's like, ah, you know, my old bones, you know, like, you know, but I, I got it, you know, but I practiced that one a lot before we even got to rehearsal, you know, it was like, it was tough. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, that, it, uh... it was interesting for me too. It was like, shit, I am getting old. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, it's you've had a lot of music between th way yeah. back when and now, so yeah, you know, uh, yeah. I, I, so I'm really looking forward to hearing that. Uh, Good. So Good. July 9th, that'll be out. Okay. Um. So tell me about the new studio album you're working on. Can okay. you tell? Can you tell us anything about it? Yeah, it's done. It's turned in. Um, it co that comes out November 12th. It's called Checkered Past. And um, we actually released a single off it a year ago. You know, we, we had had one song finished and it's a okay. song called Let You Down. And everybody loved the song so much and nobody knew what was gonna go on with the pandemic that the label and, and management, we decided to put something out, you know, because it was done, it's, it was so different and so cool. And we got a huge response to that song. I was like, wow, okay. So with that in mind, with, you know, having this kind of like different thing that we did and people really loving it so much, I approached the rest of the record slightly differently than, than normal. You know, it's like I was more careful to include some other things that have that feeling, you know, that, that kind of emotion behind it. Because Phil, you know, he's really good at the slow stuff. You know, like he can really phrase and that melancholy emotion that he's really good at, at, at doing happens if I write the right kind of music for him. So there's a little bit more of that on this record. Of course, there's still, you know, what L.A. Guns fans expect, you know, the really hard hitting, punchy, riffy, you know, kind of Aerosmith meets Van Halen meets the Yardbirds kind of thing. But it's more diverse than the last two records. You know, there's, there's, there's just more music, you know, and um, with all the time, you know, I had to, to think about it and write and I had more time to be more interesting. So um, I know LA Guns fans are going to love this record. It's really cool. Right on. Well, that, that's good news. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. When you released the song last year, I thought maybe it was just a, a non-album single right. that you're putting out. You know, yeah. So that's cool that it's, it's going to wind up on Checkered Past. Yeah, yeah. That, that's the thing. Is that was the big discussion. You know, when the lockdown really happened, it's like, wow, we released this song. You know, how could we put a song on a record that, that the song's going to be almost two years old by the time the record comes out? And, but everybody was in agreement. you know, it's such an important song. It has to be on a record. It just can't be this thing floating out in space, you know, so it's on there and it fits in with the record. And that, that would have been a deciding factor too. And I, and I just wrote this completely different thing and it was such an oddball, then it probably wouldn't have been on the record. But there's other things that are similar. Okay. Yeah. I would never characterize L.A. Guns as AOR, right. but I love listening to your albums. I mean, I, I, I like hearing the songs on the radio. I like playing them on my show, but mm -hmm. I love just sitting down and listening to an album straight through. I like the arrangement and why you've chosen, you know, tr understanding why you've ordered songs the way you did. Right. So it's, it just seemed a little odd when that song came out and it was just out in space like a standalone so, kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, and, and that's interesting too. It's like, I'm 55. So, you know, from the beginning, um, my thing was live albums, you know, when I was a teenager, you know, cause you know, Peter Frampton, Nugent, Aerosmith, Ozzy, UFO, Zeppelin, obviously, or, you know, all these live records. So those records combined with records like 2112 by Rush, and the Black Sabbath records and all these great studio records, albums mean way more to me than 
individual singles, you know, um, because like you probably you experience the album, you yeah. know, like you, like you get in that headspace, you know, it's like if I put on, you know, like a, a Yardbirds or something like that, it's like it's like oh yeah, you know, I'm I'm in 1966 right now, and like I'm, I'm feeling what these guys are feeling, and you know, trying to get that vibe. And that was the magical thing about, you know, music in the 50s, 60s and 70s and to the 80s to an extent is that people were really sitting down at home and listening to albums, you know. Um, and before that, like my mom would make mixtapes, you know, when I was a kid and she had a cassette player in our Volkswagen van and, you know, and it would be Rufus and then the Rolling Stones and, you know, then the Wild Cherry, and, you know, Jackson oh, yeah. 5, you know. So that's how I grew up listening to music in the car. But at home, we always listen to albums. Sounds like you had a pretty cool mom. Yeah, she's really cool. Total hippie. <laughs> right on. Me too. That's how I wound up with the name Pariah. There you go. So. <laughs> awesome name. Thank you. So you've done... So you've done the the real heavy metal, the doom metal influenced Sunbomb project. You've got new LA Guns studio album done, the live album's mixed and it's coming out. What's what's next for Tracy Guns? What is there a different genre you want to explore? Well, I mean I always record what's coming through at the time. You know what I mean? So right now I have my youngest son just turned 14 months old, you know, and it's like now that I finished all these records and I did another record. I did a record, uh, Social Disorder, the Swedish rock man. That record comes out in, in a couple weeks. Um, so I was so busy writing and recording and doing all this stuff for like the past year and a half. I'm just looking forward to the stuff coming out and then me being with my baby boy and you know when touring happens then we'll start talking about it but i'm in no hurry to <laughs> to get on the road right now are you gonna tour sunbomb no no there's just there's just no time you know to to do that because you know michael's also in striper you know and they have they're they have a new record coming out as well and um you know but i mean in the honest reality if Sunbomb were to become something that was so in demand for some reason, which we don't expect, um, and there's a lot of money involved, then adults make decisions based on those types of things. But I just don't see that happening right now. You've played with a lot of people in your career. Is there anybody you would still really like to play with that you haven't had the chance to yet? You know, that time I played with John Paul Jones was great. No, um, <laughs> I, you know, the thing is now is recording and songwriting and putting music out is easier, you know, these days, you know, to get together with people. So, I mean, sure, there's a lot of people from the past that, you know, I'm always open to working with, you know, the, the people that really came to the table, you know, and, and had the energy to do it. Like Ricky Rocket from Poison, you know, we had this thing called Devil City Angels. And he was so great to work with, man. You know, like he was so enthusiastic, had so much energy, you know, kind of an overthinker, you know, to a point, you know, it's really made it fun. You know, uh, Rudy Sarzo, even Nikki Six, you know, I mean, I would love to write and record music, you know, uh, but again, it's time, you know, I mean, it, it, it's just finding time and being excited about doing something like that. I mean, I might feel differently in a year after I haven't had any commitments. You know, that's the thing that's nice right now. I have no musical commitments other than I do have a musical co commitment. Um, Jack Russell's doing a solo record and I'm, going to play all the guitar on that record once the songs are written so that's a commitment that's the only commitment i have right now and who know, who knows when that's going to happen so oh i'd like to hear that i've, I've always been a fan of his voice oh he's amazing it'll definitely be zeppelin -y, i promise <laughs> yeah he just um i think the very first zeppelin cover i heard 
or the or maybe the first one that I took notice of and liked was when Great White did the immigrant song, and it was just amazing. Amazing, yeah, yeah. I mean, he's authentic. You know, when it comes to Robert Plant, you know, he really is able to channel that that soul and that that bluesy feel. You know, which really comes from Elvis Presley. You know, I mean, that's. Robert Plant is like a perfect hybrid of uh, Steve Marriott from Humble Pie and Elvis Presley, you know? And when you understand that, it's like, if I were to sing A Whole Lot of Love, it'd be like, you need cooling, baby, I'm not cool. Oh, oh, oh. You know what I mean? It's like, you can really understand Robert Plant. Like if you go, okay, he's got kind of Steve Marriott's voice, but he phrases just like Elvis, you know, and because that's, what he was into you know jack russell really gets that you know he really understands robert plant and led zeppelin music you know which i'm obsessed with i've always been obsessed with it and that's why i started playing guitar in the first place so i'm curious to see what that's gonna sound like you know me and him and we've talked about doing this for almost 20 years now you know, so again, it's on Frontiers Records, you know, they, they put it together. And uh, I think it's a great combo. You know, we'll see. I, uh, I recently talked to Connie Bloom, who said he played of the Electric Boys. Okay. Um, and he, uh, there was this uh, tribute in Sweden for royalty and for Jimmy Page. And Connie had to play Zeppelin in front of Jimmy Page. Oh, shit. <laughs> yeah. He was telling me, he says, they, they decided to do a medley and they changed it up and they did a lot of very different ways to do it. And he says, as soon as we got off stage, we went straight to the bar, like very fast. <laughs> and he goes, and then I get a tap on my shoulder and this big guy says, Jimmy Page would like to talk to you. And, and Connie thought, oh, I'm going to get beat up by Jimmy Page. <laughs> right. But Paige ap appreciated the performance. That's, God, what a, what a compliment, right? Yeah. So amazing. Yeah. You know. <laughs> I get it. So, yeah, I don't uh, want Jimmy Page watching me play. Anything else we should know? Anything else you want to talk about? You know, I don't want to um, overload anybody's brain with, with, you know, Tracy Gunn's music. You know, it's like plenty of it. It's all enjoyable. And uh, I hope everybody just checks it out. That's it. Right on. And so what we're checking out is the Sunbomb album, which is out. Uh, May 14th. May 14th, yep. Then the live Cocked and Loaded recording, which is July 9th. And then Social Disorder, is that? Yeah, Social Disorder comes out around the same time as Sunbomb. And then... Uh, Checkered Pass, the new studio LA Guns record. That's November 12th. All right. Well, Tracy Guns, thank you very much. I wish you all the success in the world with the new albums coming out. Thanks. Uh, appreciate you coming on the show. Okay, man. We'll talk again soon, yeah? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Have a great day. Remember, to hear the music discussed in this interview, stream the on-demand Hard Heavy and Hair show at pariahrocks.com. That's P A R. I eight H R O C K S dot com. Also hit pariahrocks.com to stream or listen on a radio station near you. The regular two hour hard heavy and hair show with me, Pariah Burke. Hard Heavy and Hair is your weekly dose of hard rock, heavy metal, and hair bands from the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, 20 teens, and today, including the latest new releases, your old favorites, and deep cuts and rare hair, along with rock news and trivia. 